welcome, welcome. We're very happy that you're here joining us. Um, thank you for giving us a little bit of grace while we troubleshooted. This is um, the first time ever that we've done uh, live. <laughs> Um, so we are glad to have you here. Um, we're glad to be joined by Dr. Margot Farrick. Um, Jennifer Spadafora and I are here from the school committee doing a little bit of moderating tonight. Um, but before we uh, turn it over to Dr. Farrick, we wanna give Danielle a chance to introduce himself and talk a little bit about the, the interpretation piece that we're, we're gonna be using tonight. And if I may, just before Danielle starts, if I can just ask everybody to um, mute themselves just so I don't, we don't have any background interference, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, my name is Danielle. I am part of the team of interpreters with Rosetta Languages, who will be here to make sure that this meeting is accessible to participants in uh, seven different languages today. Um, English speaking folks, y'all can just hold tight for a moment. We're going to introduce um, ourselves in our target languages and explain to folks how to get on the language channels. Um, and for the interpreter team, uh, why don't we just uh, choose a random order for us to go through. I'll introduce in Arabic, then I'll pass it on to Spanish, Portuguese, Haitian Creole, Mandarin, Cantonese, Vietnamese, and then we will uh, get started. So I'll go ahead in Arabic. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Ahlan wa sahlan bikum. Ana ismi Daniel wa ana hakun al mutarjim lil logal arabiya. Liman yurid an yistama ila hadhi al muhadra bil logal arabiya. Bada khamis daqaiq sayyadhar ala shasha zirar bishakl al kur al ardiya. Adghat ala had al zirar wa akhtar al logal arabiya Arabic. Wa bada dalik satakun ala kanat al logal arabiya wa satisma asuti. وكل شيء في الترجمة إذا كان عندكم أي صعوبة أو أسئلة يا ريت ارفع صوتك أو اكتب في صندوق الدردشة ونحن سنكون في مساعدتكم شكرا جزيلا um, Emily take it away Buenas noches a todos. Eh, gracias por estar aquí con nosotros hoy y para su paciencia. Esa es la primera vez que estamos aquí en vivo. Eh, estamos aquí hoy noche con Margot Ferrick y Jennifer Spedefora y yo estamos aquí presente del comité escolar. Pero primero le voy a dar la palabra a Daniel para que introduzca el equipo de intérpretes. Eh, por favor, mientras tanto, si pueden poner eh, sus equipos en mudo durante la presentación para que no se escuche mucho ruido de de atrás. Entonces tenemos eh, interpretación de Rosetta Languages. Estamos aquí con siete idiomas, árabe, español, portugués, haitiano, criollo, eh, mandarín, cantonés y vietnamita. Eh, cuando se empieza eh, la función de interpretación, va a haber un globito en el fondo de su pantalla y ahí puede empujar el globo y escuchar la presentación en español. Muchísimas gracias. Portuguese, next. Oi, boa noite, gente. Meu nome é Raíssa, eu sou intérprete de, de português. Eu estou trabalhando hoje com Rosetta Languages e a gente está oferecendo interpretação em sete idiomas diferentes. Daqui a pouco a gente vai ligar a função de interpretação simultânea. Se você estiver participando através de um computador, você vai ver um globo aparecer na parte de baixo da sua tela. Por favor, escolhe esse globo, pode clicar no globo. Aí você vai ver uma opção de interpretação de linguagem. Aí você pode escolher o português. Se você estiver participando através de um celular, na parte de baixo da sua tela, você vai ver três polinhas com a palavra more ou mais. Aí você pode escolher essa, essa opção. Aí também você vai ver a escolha de é, linguagem de interpretação. Aí você pode escolher o português. Se você tiver qualquer dificuldade ou dúvida, pode jogar no, cha no chat ou pode simplesmente abrir o microfone e falar. E se você não estiver falando para evitar que tenha barulho de fundo, por favor, se coloque no mudo. Now I'll pass it, I'll pass it to Haitian Creole. Nikita, you're on mute. Yes, ok. Um, c'est interprète qui a interprété en créole, le nom c'est Nikita Lamour. On a interprété aujourd'hui à travers Rosetta, language qui a interprété sept langues là. 
uh, qui là donc nous parlons pas instruction au côté uh, on prend un signe qui marque mort on va mettre lui après ça à grand globe qui va venir après ça on va taper on va choisir langue en en Haitian Creole on va choisir donc nous là avec sept monde nos sept cap interprétés là sur notre pendeau nous vous bienvenue ok all right Uh, Haitian Creole. Uh, we have Vietnamese next. Oh, okay. Uh, chào quý vị, tôi tên là Phương Nguyễn. Uh, tôi hiện tại đang cư ngụ ở Revere, cũng là cái um, thành phố sát bên của Mô Đình. Uh, chúng tôi uh, một đội ngũ của những người thông dịch viên của um, um, Rosetta Language và chúng tôi có um, bao gồm có bảy uh, ngôn ngữ ở đây: ngôn ngữ uh, tiếng uh, Tây Ban Nha, tiếng Bồ Đào Nha tiếng Haitian Creole và tiếng um, phổ thông và tiếng um, quảng và tiếng Việt uh, và chúng tôi sẵn sàng giúp đỡ quý vị nếu mà có câu hỏi gì um, và bây giờ tôi sẽ uh, uh, yes uh, Mandarin please um, take the next position Thank you Ah,大家好，我的名叫Terry哈，今天我给大家做翻译，呃，国语的翻译。然后感谢大家来参加我们今天的这一次的会议然后呢我们今天呢有这个Rosetta Language提供有七种不同的语言 包括Haitian 然后你就可以可以听到广东话或者是国语的翻译了。Okay,好的,谢谢哈,祝大家有一个愉快的夜晚。I'll okay, pass to Cantonese, Anna. Good evening, everyone. I'm Anna. I'll be your Cantonese interpreter for the meeting tonight. 大家好,我是Anna,我是你今晚的广东话翻译员。我今天在跟我们的团队翻译团队,在为你服务的。今天我们有很多种语言的翻译,有广东话,普通话。西班牙语、阿拉伯文和海地语的。那么,如果你想听到广东话同步翻译的时候,你就看到下面,平光屏,荧光屏下面有个地球语的。那你去按这个地球语,你就会听到广东话同步翻译的。如果你没有看到这个
for the past 24 year, years is really being able to identify where the, the kind of the sweet spot is between creating strong um, classroom experiences for students where supporting their social emotional needs, their behavioral needs, as well as rigorous instruction. Um, so I come to, to with you to meet with you as a community today, really letting you know that fundamentally, one of my core beliefs is believing that it takes a lot more than just a school to educate kids these days. The school is a little ecosystem in and of itself, but it's completely reflective of the bigger ecosystem of the community as a whole. I can tell you much of my success, most of my success as a public educator has been through um, partnerships and collaboration fundamentally with the community as a whole, opening the doors of the schools, partnering with the strengths of the community, building, um, you know, whether it's bringing in mental health support from community mental health agencies or um, working with a local community college to have a gateway and early college experience for students. Um, one really cool thing I did back in Lowell was tapped um, many different people, business people, politicians, the mayor, um, to come in and talk about how they, who they are and how they became what they are in order to really show students that they can be anything they want to be. What is the trajectory for them to get there? So having said that, that's just a little bit of who I am and I would love to hear from all of you. It, oh, it's really bad. on. Fantastic. Thank you so much for- Okay, merci. Oh, uh, Nikita, I think oh. you should not be in the right channel. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Farrick. And uh, so for anyone who has questions, we're happy to open the floor um, to all of you. So uh, please feel free to either um, raise your hand uh, and we'll call on you and we've got one already or if you'd rather um, please feel free to type your question in the chat um, but please feel free to speak up and we're excited we'll start with Patrick Fitzgerald. Good evening thank you Adam. Um, good evening Dr. Farrick. Um, welcome to Malden however remotely um, and thank you for uh, taking the time to, to meet with the community. Um, I am uh, a parent of two special needs uh, students in elementary school, so I'm excited to see a candidate um, that has such uh, special education experience. I've also um, had the pleasure of working many years in the city of Lowell, where I know you spent a lot of time, and as they say, there's a lot to love about Lowell, so I'm excited to see uh, someone who has that experience uh, working in the schools. Um, I have some questions about uh, the current community where you work, Southbridge, um, and I understand that it remains in receivership uh, under the jurisdiction of the state. And when the receivership was extended in 2019, one of the, the reasons that at least Commissioner Riley made public was the concerns about the graduation rate for students with disabilities and English language learners. I don't know if you have a perspective on that or um, uh, could explain the situation that your district has been and how it's come along. Sure, I caught most of that, but there was a lag and I the, the meat of the question I missed. I think you're asking me um, what part of the reason the, the districts remained in receivership was because of the um, lagging account, um, student outcome data for students that are ELL and special ed? Yes. Um, and then what have we done to, to start moving things in the right direction? Did I capture it? That is correct, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I have been in the district for just about four years and I can tell you um, there's a few reasons why the district was taken over to begin with. And then there's lots of these little pieces that fall into it. One was the governance um, in the greater town, the school committee and the town council. It was very, the school committee in and of itself was extraordinarily dysfunctional. They had had something like 11 superintendents in five years. It was just this constant churn. Um, and the, the other piece of it is that there was also the same level of churn in um, all central office staff. So schools couldn't get their footing. 
as a result of all of that, everything was broken and genuinely all like school level, central office, like we couldn't even get stamps or water because bills hadn't been paid when I came into the district. So we've had to rebuild how we do school in each school as well as the entire infrastructure at central office. And because the impact that that has when central office isn't functioning, it absolutely dri you know, drips down into the schools and, and affects it. Um, so in terms of ELL and special ed, we had to go back to absolute basics. We didn't have an operation manual. We didn't, um, in terms of even being able to have how to identify students that might possibly have a disability. What, we, what was happening was our tier one, which is the way you do school for all students. Like you, you wanna create a tier one where you're meeting the needs behaviorally, academically, social, emotionally for all students and then create a system to, to be able to identify when students need something different, when they're not being successful in any of those categories and they'd be able to look at data and then be able to have interventions. Um, and, we're, we're, and that's called the multi-tiered system of support. So where we are um, now is that we, we finally, in all schools have a really with fidelity solid tier one. So now we're starting to be able to identify what's happening with kids that aren't successful. Prior to this, what we had was the only game in town really was special ed. So any student that um, wasn't successful for whatever reason was, get, was sent to be identified and being labeled as disabled through special ed, even if they didn't have a disability. I can tell you we had two or three students placed in out district placements, which you know what that costs, that didn't even have IEPs. Like that's how far extreme the district was. So we had to go back and really start first thing first was create a solid tier one and knowing who our kids are. Um, we had to recreate and all we have, um, we're moving towards a full as much as possible an inclusion process where students are getting what they need in the general ed classroom with their, with their um, general ed peers. We do have, um, we did have, and still do have sub-separate classrooms, but there was no entrance and exit criteria. They, there was no um, like kind of prototype of what type of child is going to succeed. First of all, needs to be in this type of programming and, and how to succeed. Kids that were um, identified that might have autism were in programs where students that were, were really struggling with social emotional challenges. It was just, it was chaotic. So we had to just start creating, who are our kids? What programs do we need? What does it look like? What's the criteria to get a student in to a program that might need to be outside the general ed classroom? Because you can't do that lightly. Like we need to know um, what does that programming look like? And more importantly, how do we know when a student's ready to start transitioning back into general ed? Because it's really about helping students develop um, new skills and new ways of approaching academics and, and life skills. Um, so that was the first step. And then um, really building up our teachers. Uh, yeah. Really building up our teachers capacity because what we realized was um, our teachers were struggling with differentiation, understanding who our students are and really creating really solid professional development that's continuing. Like four years in, we're still continuing to, to just go deeper on the same um, strategic priorities. And the same is with um, our ESL students. We are working um, in the, not, it's, it, it's, it's different programming, but it's a similar approach to how we're trying to make sure our students are identified correctly. We have the right staff and we're meeting their needs. Again, mostly in the general ed setting. Um, it goes back to knowing who our kids are, creating environments that they're going to be really successful, supporting the, the teachers to make sure that they're feeling successful with the students, and really working with the parents because the parents know the kids better than anybody else. They're the experts on the kids. Um, so making sure that they're at the table for, for much of this planning and implementation. Thank you. You're welcome. We do have a question in chat uh, from Dexy Garcia. 
that says, what are you hoping to change if you were selected as superintendent? Oh, that's kind of a tough question. Um, I think I need to understand who you all are first before we even think about changing anything. And that takes patience because it's gonna take some time um, for whoever your superintendent is gonna to be to really understand who is Malden right now. And honestly, more importantly, who do you all want Malden to be down the road a little bit? And then making sure that we create the, pri the, the priorities to get there, aligning it with budget and resources. Um, but that's a conversation about change that needs to be done collaboratively with with all of you as community members and all the educators that want to be part of the conversation. Um, all right. So just a reminder to everyone here, if you do have a question, please feel free to type it in chat um, or hit the raise hand feature and you can ask uh, live and in person. Try to uh, make sure that it's slow enough that our interpretation can hear it as well. Ari Taylor. Oops, hold on, you are muted. I unmuted and then I remuted myself. I apologize. You would think that I'd have the Zoom thing down <laughs> by now, um, but it's actually my first one today, so go Lucky figure. You. I, right? <laughs> I had a break. Um, Welcome and thank you so much for, for uh, joining us tonight and allowing the community to get to know you. Um, I have a few questions, but I think the one that I'm, I'm most interested in your response would be, um, are you happy with how the, the transition is going with how the state is handling the current transition back to school? Um, and if so, why? And if not, what is it um, that you would change or, or what do you see as, you know, some things that, that yeah, you would... I think that's a really good question. And I think what's really important to understand is that you have, we have to make decisions that are right for our community. I can give you an example in Southbridge currently, um, we have 75 on average of every elementary student pre-K through five in school every day, five days a week. Um, we have a hybrid model at the high school and middle school where we could have just as many kids in, but two or three days a week. They choose to stay home because it's the, they're doing full synchronous. So whether they're sitting on their couch or they're sitting in a classroom, they're getting the same, same ish education and they don't want to come to school and eat cruddy food and ride a bus and, um, you know, follow all the rules. Um, and we knew in our community that it was paramount because the community need was that we bring our kids back. So that was, that was what we needed to do. And I can tell you, I'm extraordinarily proud of the work that we've done because um, although Southbridge as a whole has been on fire with COVID often between the fifth and 15th top rating positive rates every week and we've been in red forever, we have had less than half a percent of our entire adult and student population test positive, and we have not had a single transmission. Um, but I have to tell you, me and uh, we, we have a lead nurse that's doing this. It's a 24 hour a day job. Like we are super, super tight. Having said that, I think Doc? you look at what Hello, the commissioner and the governor is saying and understanding that we do have uh, what's called local control in, in communities and you need to do what's right for you all, knowing that down the road, kids gotta come back to school. Like we, at some point, um, this has got to sort of work itself out and people have to be vaccinated and kids need the sense of community. Um, so I think it's really, and I really see how complicated the issue is because although in my current district, we have less of a political piece because the school committee doesn't have a lot of authority over the school department. Um, so that was one less little battle, but we worked really closely with our, our union to create environments where not just the students were feeling safe, but the adults were feeling safe. Um, and I have to tell you, 
teachers are coming and they are absolutely rocking it. I, I was in an early elementary today for a couple of hours and on, this is gonna sound really pathetic, but I almost started to cry. I was in a classroom and it was just, she was teaching kids in front of her. She was teaching kids at home and it was, and she was a first year teacher like I, and it was just beautiful. But how hard everybody is working to do this, um, regardless of where you're teaching or where your kids are, it's it's a challenge. I hope I answered your question. Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have, and I'll come right back to you, Patrick. We have a question in chat from Bruce and Amy Friedman. It says, what do you think is the most important thing you learned about running a school district from your prior work experience? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think I could tell you two things. First of all, I am the person at the table, every table that makes sure we're talking about kids, that whatever we're talking about comes back to kids. Um, and that, that predated, you know, the job that I have now is always how I see the world. Um, I think the most important thing I learned was about um, really active listening and sort of leaving assumptions and perspectives behind me and really trying to understand the context of what's happening and what's going on. Um, and just asking a ton of questions because if you don't do that, that's when missteps can happen. Because if we don't have the context to understand where we are, then we're never gonna get to where we wanna go. Um, and I think the other most important thing I learned was that you, we need to do the work together. Like it has to be a, collabor a collaboration at identifying challenges, um, really looking at what solutions can be, um, and then everybody taking a little bit of the lift to, to implement where we need to go. Um, and most importantly is to always lean on the strengths, really understanding what is going well, why is it going well, and let's lean on that when we're trying to, to, to work with something challenging. Great. Um, and I think I'll turn it back to Patrick. Thanks, Adam. And if there's any other questions that I want to take time, I want everybody to have the opportunity to ask um, before I would about, or what you mentioned about um, working with the teachers to bring them back into the, the classrooms. Um, I noticed uh, on your resume, uh, you were able to hire, um, had some success with hiring a more diverse workforce. I would ask you how you went about do doing that and how that, um, how you were able to be so successful. And on the flip side, um, what kind of collective bargaining experience have you had in the position that you had given the lack of authority with the school committee in Southbridge and the, and the receivership sure. and working with unions? Okay, I'll take the first part of the question first. Um, what we've done is really, one. if you were to ask me the biggest challenge in Southbridge, it's about, it's hiring talent. It's about getting people to wanna to come and work in the district. So we had to really think outside the box. And um, two, two things that I think are the most important is that as we've gotten healthier and the negative reputation has decreased, we don't still get a ton of positive, but the negative like social media and news coverage is, is really died down. Um, we've been able to tap the community because there is a lot of um, amazing people that have started to want to come back and work in the in our in our school district in our community is um, the school district itself is 50% 57% um, Latinx and the community reflects that it might not be the exact same percentages so we've been able to bring in a lot of people that just have pride in living and in, in Southbridge and want to be part of the the um, school district. So that's been a huge piece of it. Um, the other piece of it is we sort of started thinking outside the box. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to start poaching teachers. Um, Worcester is our biggest, closest city, um, particularly from Worcester. Um, and we wanted teachers that were seasoned and really just looking for something different, like maybe coming, like going to do some work in a school district that there's a little bit of social justice edge or, or just want, to 
to be part of a turnaround. But there's so many barriers for a professional, professional status teacher high up on the pay grade to leave a district, right? Because they have seniority, they've got professional teaching, teaching status and they're getting the money. And most districts cap how much you'll pay a teacher coming in. You won't usually give professional teaching status. Um, so we started posting positions, high, specifically high needs, math, science, special ed, signing bonus. I think I just signed somebody with a $3,000 signing bonus to get a really stellar special ed teacher. Um, we would match their salary, where they're coming from, give them professional teaching status after like 90 days. We, we would usually just give them a little bit, like let's make sure where this is a good fit. Um, and that, and then we, we were able to recruit teachers that way which has been really helpful. Um, we've also gotten creative in allow working with universities for first year teachers. First year, there's, so there's a whole licensing lane that goes with teaching. Um, many districts won't hire a teacher unless they have, um, oh, what's it called? Not professional. Um, there's, into, there's, there's provisional and there's professional and then there's, I forget what it's called. It's the words escaping me. Intermediate, I don't know. But anyway, we, we have partnered with universities to take first year teachers um, that might not have finished their, um, their student teaching hours and we hire them with a professional license, allow them to, to get hired as a first year teacher and get their student teaching done at the same time with a ton of support. So support from the university and support from our mentor teacher mentor program. So that's also getting us um, looked at by other candidates who might not normally have come. And then in order to keep our teachers, we have something that's called um, per, uh, advanced teacher and master teacher. That's where teachers who have a certain amount of years in the district and are really showing to be like stellar teachers um, teacher leaders, they can apply to become a master teacher, which they still stay a teacher and they can get up to a $15,000 bump in pay. Um, and then their classroom really becomes like an exemplar and they take on some coaching roles with teachers, with other teachers and leadership um, opportunities within the building. And that's helping us maintain um, some of our teachers and we're getting, we're, we've definitely stabilized our um, retention rate. Thank you. And if you could just speak a little bit about your collective bargaining experience. Oh, yeah, with sorry, I forgot about that. Um, I'm it. currently leading the collective bargaining for teachers. We're in the middle of negotiations. Um, I think we actually have a, a session tomorrow night. I have um, then, so the receiver, the superintendent kind of takes the back seat and he's sort of like the mayor, like we, we prep and we talk about where they're going. Um, but I, with our um, attorney and our business manager are leading all of the negotiations for teachers. We have successfully negotiated with EAs, with um, our secretaries, food service. We also did custodians, but I wasn't part of that. That was a, a little while ago. Um, but I'm getting very comfortable in the role of kind of figuring out what's right, what's right for kids and teachers and um, supporting them. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Farrick. Um, so we have a question in the chat um, from uh, Sue Brill on what are you currently reading in the education field? Oh. Who inspires you as an educational leader? Okay. Um, I need to be completely honest that I am about two years out of my dissertation and my graduate program. And that was really like unbelievably intense. And I probably have not read um, an educational leadership book. Um, what I do have sitting on my desk and refer to it all the time is um, strategies on highly engaging students like how how what strategies can we give teachers to support engaging students 
honestly, in this remote world, because we're having a really hard time. Students might be logging in, they may, may be checking the box, but engaging in the academics has been, um, we've seen that dribble off over the past few months. Um, so that's like, it's more of a tool book than a um, literature book right now. Um, but one of my favorite, I can, can I, I, mean, I can expand a little bit. Like one of my favorite books is um, Beyond the Bake Sale, which was, it's, it's kind of like a Bible on how we do um, partnerships with family and community and all of our family liaisons who support the work, you know, in all of our schools, own it, live by it, you know, breathe it. Um, so I think that's the best I got on that question. I have not read a book for pleasure either. So it's it's more, I'm all about books on tape. You would think we would have had all the time in the world the past year, but reality is we've all been on Zoom meetings, so. Oh, 100%. And by the time I get home, I'm, I'm asleep. Um, the next question we have for you from Heather Barry is, how would you define success as a superintendent short and long-term? Sure. Um, I think long-term success is um, student outcome data across the board. And I don't just mean MCAS or, you know, SATs or AP, but um, data is constantly growing in the right direction. And that could mean formative assessment data that we understand where kids, you know, kids are growing at their, at their pace. And it may not be, um, the highest score on the MCAS, but every year we're seeing growth and we're seeing improvement. Um, so I think that shows success and kids are learning their own coping skills and able to manage the world around them um, by learning different ways of being in the world. I think success in terms of climate and culture is that people, um, students are able to disagree in a healthy, respectful way and always come up from a place of understanding each other and do repair work when, when something happens that doesn't go well. That you walk in and kids are happy, like that you see students smiling and loving to come to school and that you can tell because attendance is through the roof instead of you know waning off. You cannot have success with students without unbelievable success with staff. So be able to create a climate and culture where st staff is feeling supportive, that they're feeling they're part of the solutions um, and that they're owning what's happening in their classroom and in their schools. Um, and making sure that parents and communities, the community as a whole is feeling the success of the school as well, because when that happens, the community thrives. Like it, it's symbiotic, it goes together. Um, people want to come to Malden because it's a great school system and their, you know, house rates are going to go up and, um, you know, people are going to be more involved and more invested. That's great. I, I would love to jump back up if it's okay and, and, and uh, ask you the, the second part of that Brill question, Sue Brill's question, who, who inspires you as an educational leader? Inspire. Well, I have to tell you my father. Um, I, I live in Westford, which is a very high functioning um, school district that, you know, it's usually in the top 10 of the state. And when we moved here, I don't know, 50 ish years ago, it was the cheapest town around and there was nothing. And it was with him and the superintendent before him that 100% built um, what Westford as a town is and as a school district is. And he tells me this story um, where they've never had like a really nice central office. It was the old jail when he was superintendent and now it's like modular classrooms outside another school. And he tells me the story where he was sitting in his office doing something and the school committee member comes in and starts like ranting about his office and how the curtains are old and how, and how he needs to get a designer in to redo his office. And he looked at her and said, why on earth would I ever spend money on that? That would be taking money from kids. Um, so I think on a very personal level, like he, he has inspired me to always put kids first and do what's right. Um, but I have some really key people 
in my life who I lean on. Um, I don't I, like, I don't want to name drop, but uh, George the guy who's, you know, part of the PBIS world. Um, like I tapped on his shoulder back in like 20, 2011 and said, you want to come to Lola? I, I think, I think we need you. And he has done, he has been with me in every step of the way in my career and the person that I go to and he um, just, because for him, the multi-tiered system of support is just part of who he is and how he sees the world. And it's just really inspired me to believe that's the way you do school. Um, so, and then I have lots of people that just like, I inspire me from different pieces of the work. Um, I think I'm really um, eclectic in terms of who I am as a leader and as a person. Um, awesome. Thank you for that. Um, so next in the queue, and I apologize if I um, obliterate anybody's names. First, I am not, not great with names. So Mei Hung uh, would like to know, would you advocate for Chinese education as part of the curriculum or elective course for high school students? Yeah, I think it goes back to meeting the needs of the community. Um, I think that's the role of a superintendent, really being able to identify what, what do we have that's working well, what could we not need anymore, and what should we put in its place? And if the community is saying that um, having Chinese electives or something that's built into secondary the, you know, high school is, then we figure out how to make that happen. Um, and what does that look like? I, I don't know a lot about the Chinese culture. So I would, we would need support to figure out what that would look like and, and, and go from there. All right. Um, the next one is from Bruce and Amy Friedman um, and timely because uh, Dr. Farrick actually got a chance last week to meet with not only our students and some of our staff, but our central office team as well. Um, and the question is, how do you prioritize your time as a superintendent? What is your prior experience with assistant superintendents that you can delegate responsibilities to? And how do you manage delegating duties to other administrators and staff? Sure. What was the very first part of that question? Just along with, how do you prioritize your time as a superintendent? So I, I think I said something one day, I said, you know, someday it would just be really nice if I could get up in the morning and actually go, like be able to tick everything off on my calendar. And somebody said to me, well, that's retirement. I said, okay. Um, so when you're in a position as a deputy or as a superintendent, you have to be able to prioritize big picture and then immediate picture, like what's going on. Um, I always say whenever anybody, if I'm in the middle of doing something and somebody needs me for something, I always prioritize kids first. Closest to kids decisions need to make, be made first, whether it's something that's um, an emergency or something that's budding or like I, I'm a type of leader that would love to know when things start brewing before anything kind of blows up. Can we prevent something from blowing up? So that's really like my baseline, closest to kids first. Um, my leadership model is genuinely 100% a distributive leadership model where um, we, we work together as a central office team, as a school-based administrator team, and really come up with, um, like, maybe, like we have, we'll be the architects of kind of what, where we need to go, but then the work gets really distributed by all of us. Um, currently now, I didn't put this on my resume, but I'm the deputy superintendent and I'm also the high school principal. And it's not because I'm superwoman, it's because we had a, a late summer resignation of our high school principal and um, we had not seen any progress in our, in our high school in years. Um, so my, my superintendent asked me, and I, I have to tell you, I did a lot of thinking about it. Um, it takes a different energy to be a building-based administrator. Um, and the only way it's successful, and we're seeing some really cool outcomes because the goal this year was to really improve the climate and culture for the staff 
because if we knew we could do that, kids were going to thrive. Um, I'm able to do it because I delegate, but it's not, it's not delegating is like top down where I'm telling people what to do. It's about sharing the work and people having um, like, what is their role and what part of the work fits into their role. Um, so, and, and I have to tell you, like we're seeing success at the high school and not to mention, I'm still the deputy superintendent and doing probably 90% of what was on my plate last year, this year, again, because as Southbridge has gotten healthier, I've been able to help develop and watch people around me grow and take on more responsibility. And that only happens if you let them do it. So it's about letting people take on um, work to grow, make mistakes in a really safe way, because that's how we all learn. Um, so, and I think there was the second part and I don't remember it. Um, just prior experience working with assistant supers, but you kind of covered it around how do you yeah, make yeah. delegating du duties? Yeah, we have directors and different titles. It's more about semantics, but yes, I have a lot of people that support the work that I work with very closely. Great, thank you. Sure. So the next question we have in the queue comes from Heather Barry, and it is, with the recent emphasis on race, equity, and justice, would your office conduct a review of the curriculum with a focus on inclusion and decolonization? That's the first question. And I don't know if you want to tackle that because this is this is a bit longer, but the remainder would be, would you also be willing to reconsider what languages are offered through the school system to expand opportunities? Sure. So in terms of the first question, um, part of there's something called a, a, a tiered, what are they, multi-tiered? No, it used to be the CPR regardless of what it's called now, because they just change it, the state comes in every few years and you actually have to do that. You have to go through all of your curriculum and look at it from a lens of cultural competency and um, diversity. A lot of um, like publishers say they do that work. So you can sometimes lean into that a little bit. And I think what's important is when you're thinking about um, looking at culture from an, uh, curriculum from an anti-bias lens, it may not be possible to have all experiences in terms of the curriculum without it, without, without bias being there, but being able to support the teachers to be able to address it when it is there and being able to facilitate conversations within the students to be able to do it respectfully and healthily. So yes, it's part of the work that the state expects us to do. Um, I would love to see where Malden is in, in that process and have they ever done a formal audit on their curriculum? And what's the second part? Would you also be willing to reconsider what languages are offered through the school system to expand opportunities? Yeah, I think that goes back to, to priorities and um, when's the last time we've, we've done, we've looked at, Malden has looked at that. Does it make sense what's still there? You have to think of a school system like as a living, breathing entity and it can't stay stagnant. It has to constantly be evaluated and assessed and reviewed. Um, and that's where parents' voice comes in, that where, where's the community voice comes in. What do we need? What do we need our students to come out? What skills, what languages are employers looking for? Um, what do students own trajectory want to look like? And what do we need to have in place so they're prepared to do that? And if that's new languages, then that's something we, we tackle but it has to fit into the whole picture. Great, thank you. Um, we've got one more question in the chat and then I'll pass it to Ari. Um, and it's from Mei Hung and it says, Malden is a very diverse community and so is the school district. How do you make all students and their families feel welcome? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think the first step is by celebrating. You sell, we, I think we need to create an environment where we're celebrating culture, we're celebrating differences, um, having the families in, having as many staff as possible to reflect the cultural identities of the students in the building. And I know that that's hard, but I know 
if somebody can walk into a, 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 a school and they may not feel comfortable speaking English, that there's someone there instantly to support them and make them feel connected and help them navigate. Um, there's also ways of we're reaching out into the community and creating what's called um, like academies where we can work with different um, cultural groups and and work on what understanding what does Malden public school look like like really basics especially if there's new people moving in to the community um, and then we would lean on lean into our um, cultural families to do some of that work with us it's about having school be accessible and people feel that they can walk in and be understood, not just language wise, but culture wise, that the communities in the schools are really responsive to the different cultural identities of students, that the tier one takes all of that into account. Um, so when we're thinking about creating um, you know, behavioral expectations that it includes different cultural perspectives. And it's not just, you know, the white people's mindset, so to speak. But in order for us to do that, we need the, we need the community to help. We need their voice, their expertise to be part of all of this. Um, and then it's authentic and real. Thank you. Uh, so next up, we have Ari Taylor with her hand up for a question. Ari. Thank you. Um, I think you kind of touched on a lot of what I was going to ask in that that last response. But um, for me, one thing that's been very important with the superintendent's office is, is communication. Um, how will you make yourself accessible, uh, reachable to the community? Um, and what ways will you work to make sure that the information is distributed to parents and, and educators and, and the school committee? Um, yeah, I think you, you bring up a really good point because I think without really transparent communication, you don't, you don't build trust. If people aren't hearing and understanding what's happening, then they go into their own heads and start coming up with assumptions. And sometimes it's not always the best thoughts, right? You just feel like I don't hear, so I'm gonna think of what I want. So I think you need to deal with um, communication in multi different, like multiple ways. Um, I think schools, and you guys will probably do this, really need to consistently reach out to families and talk about like weekly what's going on. And that can be done through, you know, a newsletter, through an email, it can be done on social media, it posted on the website. Um, in, in terms of central office communicating with the schools, same information, like we need to make sure that we're meeting regularly. I am a person, I much prefer in person. Um, and I think that is always the best way to communicate. So making sure that we're meeting regularly um, as an as a educational community together with school level leaders and district level leaders to making sure that we're all on the same page and all messaging the same point. When it comes to the school committee, like I completely respect that the school committee as an entity is supposed to function as, one, as a one, but for me, I always go back to the, the basic of relationships. Like I need to get to know each individual school committee member and they need to get to know me. Um, and really always having an open door process like I would have when I entered Southbridge I had office hours um, and honestly it was mostly community people that came um, not necessarily the educators in the district I think being visible is another way of being is communicating being in the community um, coming you know just being present and approachable um, I believe I'm a very approachable person and I you know I don't know I I guess I just approach the work that we're in this together and together we continue success. And, and you can't do that if you're sitting in an office, like working in isolation. So just constant communication. You know, I know my own district over communicates, so I don't even read all the stuff that comes, but that's the, that, I think that's the problem you want. You want people to say another email, another all call. Um, so that's what I would strive for. 
Thank you. All right, it looks like there are no more questions in the queue. Anybody else uh, have anything they'd like to ask or please feel free to raise your hand and uh, ask a question. Now's your chance. Um, and I, I just want to reiterate for those that um, English is not their first language, um, you are more than welcome to um, you know, type your question in the chat and that will be translated through our translation services um, tonight. So um, I just want to make sure everybody has um, equal opportunity to have their voices heard. Can I ask the community a question? Please. Well, it's the question I asked um, each group I've been in because it's really like really interesting to me to hear. Um, I would love to know, and not just in terms of the school, but in terms of the community as a whole, um, but it could be about the school. What are you most proud of? Like what makes you smile when you say I'm from Malden? Somebody's gonna have an answer. For they that. will. They got it. We got it. The wait time with it with the um, tra <laughs> translation. Ari, start us off. Um. So I think the the community that we have here. I think that we have school committee members um, like Adam and Jen who have gone out of their way to say, okay, the community is begging us to make these interviews trans to be part of of the process with this and and kind of not taking it as just like oh well this is how it's always been done but like no we can change it and i i think malton kind of has that attitude i think as a community um a lot of us are really active a lot of us are really involved i mean i think it it shows having over 20 people just on this call alone when people are probably zoomed out um and I, that, that gives me a sense of pride in this, in this community. That's nice. Thank you for sharing that. There are two answers in, or a couple answers in chat. Uh, Bruce and Amy says, I have found that our teachers and in-school staff are amazing. Uh, Dexy says the diversity of the people. Yeah. Uh, Sonara, our amazing sense of community. Nice. I would echo that. I would say um, Jen, Jen and I uh, were fortunate enough to do some parent uh, and community in or listening oh, sessions yeah. while we were developing the profile that you saw of a yeah. successful superintendent. And I think the thing that stuck out to me the most was uh, the consistent response that teachers in classrooms and, and school staff and paraprofessionals are able to create what feels like a sense of, of family or community yeah. uh, in their rooms and in their buildings and even in a pandemic, which is amazing. That came out really strong when I was talking with the teachers. Like it was, it was, it was um, both. It was um, how amazing they all feel working together. And on the other side of it, how sad some of them are because some staff are leaving. Um, so it really talked about the close knit sense of family and community that the schools have had. Um, so I, I, it's, that's echoed in every conversation I've had. Two more, it says real people, both the good and the bad. <laughs> uh, you know what you got, it's not fake. Uh, potential, creativity, diversity keeps me learning. Uh, right. And the diversity is what makes this community a very unique place where we can enrich each other. Yeah, I echo that. I think, I think it's one of the most exciting pieces of Malden for being a little city, you've got a rich, deep, diverse community. Yeah, I, last, uh, I'll go Jen. Uh, I, I was just gonna say, I know before we started the meeting and we were just um, kind of working out the kinks and I was, I was a little geeking out on um, translation services being offered because really this is something so new um, to the school committee, I'm pretty sure this is probably our first time being able to offer something like this. And that with the with the last answer on diversity, um, it, we have such a diverse community. 
and and they're constantly telling us what they need. Yeah. And I think we do a really good job um, at at least trying. We're we're learning. We're growing. It, there, there's always you know room for growth, but um, it just to echo on that last one, the diversity of the community. Um, you know, I know myself having children in the district. And they've learned so much in the classroom from their peers. From each other, yep. Each other from different ethnicities. And um, it's it's something that you don't get out of a textbook. It's, it's something yeah. that you don't get from curriculum. It's yeah. through experience. And you get yeah. that here in Malden. Yep. I think that's unbelievably powerful. And it helps them grow into amazing adults with different skill sets than kids from my, where I live like and truly i think it's a gift to be honest with you and so 100 percent. yeah sue sue brill just said in chat you'll learn about the whole world not just malden which is yes yep um, all right any last call for any questions comments for dr ferrick if not i'm happy to turn it over to you uh, margo if you'd like to, to say anything in closing <laughs> Um, just, I, I am honored to be here. Um, it has been a joy to, to get to know Malden pretty much from an outside looking in. I did come to Malden last weekend and went to Dom's and had lunch, but we ate in the car. We were COVID safe. Um, but it, it, I, I don't know. There's just, a, there's just an energy, um, that just makes, that makes me feel alive. Like, when I was in the city and checking out all the schools and, and driving around and I, it just, I don't know, it, it felt right. Um, I believe I can support the work and continue on the amazing trajectory, help do some tweaking where some things need to improve maybe a little bit faster. Um, but I know the fact that all, like so many people between parents um, came on to the chat that you all are on this chat that you guys are invested and will do it with me, um, which really does make the work a little bit lighter. So if I'm given the opportunity to be the superintendent, I am really excited at working with all of you um, and learning, learning from all of you as well, because there's so much to know. So thank you. Thank you. Um... The, the, Jen said it, Dr. Farrick is a, a pioneer for us, right? This is our first time ever doing live interpretation. Um, we're so honored that she's here and she's given so much of her time over the past week or two to the district. And, um, you know, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Jen to sort of talk about what's coming next. Yeah, so um, this will not be the last time you get to meet um, Dr. Farrick. Um, so just a reminder to community members next uh, Monday, um, March 8th, if I'm correct, the school committee will then be conducting our um, interview with Dr. Farrick, and that is at 6 p.m. And that will also be um, hosted via Zoom, and correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, we'll also be offering translation services for that as well. Oh, yes. So just to make sure um, our entire community um, from corner to corner um, is able to view and be a part of this process, which is, I think, the most important thing right now. So again, to everybody that's that's on here or maybe watching later through recording, um, we, we will get to see Dr. Farrick one more time next Monday. And, uh, and we look forward to that. Yeah, no, me too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Dexy's question, different Zoom link. Uh, please check out uh, maldenps.org slash super search. All of the Zoom links are, are listed there. I'd just like to also thank um, Rosetta for their translation services um, this evening. It has been fantastic to have you all here. And I'll be quite honest, I was popping through different languages that I speak myself to be able to listen in. Um, and. I, I really, from all of us um, on the city side, the, the school committee side, we thank you for um, all of your efforts and being a part of this process tonight. All right. All right. Have thank you so time. much, everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>